Thank you, Dennis. We want to welcome everybody, and we're so excited that we're able to do this on Zoom. The Authors' Night uh, event has been going on for 16 years, and we were concerned that we might not be able to put it together without being able to see each other. But we did it, and here we are uh, engaged in the process and looking forward to hearing Neil and Bob. And Steve is going to introduce the two speakers. <laughs> we'll show and tell. We'll show and tell. So here are a couple of books of, of Neil's uh, that we've just recently reread and enjoyed all over again. His next book is a magisterial two-volume biography of Ted Kennedy. And here is what Douglas Brinkley says about the book. Neil Gabler's Catching the Wind is an awesome biographical achievement. Gabler, a brilliant historian and prodigious researcher, has produced a landmark study of Washington politics in the Robert Caro tradition. Highly recommended. We're delighted that his fellow biographer, Bob Spitz, who's written a wonderful book about the Beatles, the interviewing Neil. Take it away, Bob. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm glad you could be here. Uh, I'm here in Los Angeles tonight. Uh, wish I could be there with Neil and uh, talk, but this is a crazy time, and uh, this is the way we're going to handle it tonight. This is a remarkable book, the Ted Kennedy biography of Neil's. I uh, was up late last night finishing it. It exceeded all of my expectations, and I expect a lot of Neil Gabler. He's, uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, when I was about to embark on the Beatles biography uh, almost 15 years ago, I called my agent and I said, I am in over my head. I need to talk to a real biographer. And he said, well, who do you want to talk to? And I said, I want to talk to Neil Gabler. And so he introduced me to Neil's agent, and Neil's agent put me in touch with Neil. And he taught me more about focusing, about how to uh, do my research, how to think of myself as a biographer. And it is all there in his writing, especially in this book about Ted Kennedy. It's a wonderful piece of work, and I'm really happy to be here tonight. Neil, my hat's Thank off. You. I mean, I, you know, I... I... I, I don't want to make this a mutual admiration society, but I've learned an awful lot from you. Uh, you know, my, I always tell my students, there are three things that you do when you're uh, learning how to write. You read the best, you steal from the best, and then you make it your own. Uh, so I read you, I steal from you, and I try and make it my own. So no, That's uh, nice of you. Listen, you and I have both written biographies about cultural figures. And then we've both pivoted into the political world. How did you go from Winchell and Disney and Barbara Streisand to Ted Kennedy? It's such a different process. It is a different process. You know, I, I, I've been kind of typed as a, uh, you know, as a Hollywood biographer, even though Walter Winchell spent some time in Hollywood, but primarily not a Hollywood biographer, and a biographer of figures of popular culture. But, I've always been interested in politics. I was a political science major in college. I always wanted to write a political biography. And when I finished Disney, I knew my next book would be a political biography. And I proposed certain, uh, several books to, uh, to my publisher at the time, um, one of which was a biography of William Jennings Bryan, because I felt that all modern politics begins, germinates really with William Jennings Bryan. He's half Ronald Reagan and half Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. um, but frankly, uh, you know, I knew the book wasn't going to be a gigantic seller. It would be a gigantic book physically. Most of my books are. Um, and I proposed another book, which uh, I won't go into the details uh, of that book, but was one that I felt very, very strongly about. Uh, but finally, you know, we came to the, uh, 
to the idea of, of doing this book, not because uh, it was Ted Kennedy. Frankly, I don't begin my books with a subject. Uh, I begin my books with a challenge, with a question. And uh, in this case, I was really interested in writing a book about what to me is the predominant political question of the last 50 years, what happened to American liberalism? And I say that as uh, all of my friends who are watching this know as, a, as a, an ardent liberal myself. And, and so that was the question. And now the, the, uh, the process was, who could we write about, who could I write about, that would focus attention and help me answer that question. I didn't have an answer. I never have an answer when I embark on the project. If I had an answer, I wouldn't write the book. Uh, and my publisher and I both agreed that Ted Kennedy would be an interesting figure uh, to use as a prism to examine the demise of American liberalism. And, and so that's how I arrived at you know, Ted Kennedy. Uh, you know, I, I would like to say that there was some uh, you know, tremendous lurch in moving from Hollywood figures and figures of popular culture to Ted Kennedy. But of course, Ted Kennedy is a figure of popular culture as well. You know, he right. straddles those worlds. You know, he's a pol political figure, but he's certainly a, a figure of the popular culture. And it made it easy to write about him uh, because of that. Because in order to understand him, you do have to understand, you know, his role in popular culture, not only his, but the Kennedys generally. Right. Well, both of them have written about subjects, political subjects, who have been written about endlessly. There have been previous biographies of Kennedy, previous biographies of Ronald Reagan, and both with the author's cooperation. What possesses you to take another look at a subject like Kennedy? And how do you deal with the process of what came before? Well, I never write a book. Uh, frankly, in which I think, you know, the, the, the questions that I pose have been answered by somebody else because, you know, that would be, you know, idiotic for me to do. I, that's, not, that's not why I'm writing the book. I'm writing the book to take this long journey, and it is almost always a long journey. In this case, it was a 10-year journey to, to answer the questions, you know, I, I pose. Um, so you read other biographies, and it's not that these biographies are less than the biography you intend to write. I never feel that way. Uh, well, I won't say never. There are a few instances here and there. But in the case of Ted Kennedy, there are a number of books that have been written about Ted Kennedy. They are not less than they are different from the book that I intended to write. As I said, the protagonist of my book, narratively, narratively, is ostensibly Ted Kennedy. But the real protagonist of the book is political morality. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that anyone who has written about Ted Kennedy has written about Ted Kennedy in that fashion. Robert Caro said he wrote about Lyndon Johnson because he wanted to write about power and the varieties of power and the way the political power operated. I wanted to write about Ted Kennedy because I wanted to write about political morality and the way it operates. And you I thought that Ted, Ted Kennedy was a perfect figure to, to use for that exploration. Mm -hmm. You call it political morality, but from what I gather, aside from the book being about politics and statesmanship, it's also a book about empathy. Empathy from someone in a position to help other people, and who's dedicated his life to doing exactly that. Am I right? You're ap I mean, Bob, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, mm -hmm. For me, and this may, I, I'm, I, this may be why I'm a liberal, um, <laughs> empathy is political morality. Mm -hmm. uh, those of us who've lived through these last 50 years in which American politics has undergone what are really a change in its tectonic plates have seen the change from a politics that was empathy driven to one that is clearly not empathy driven. Right. Uh, my daughter, you know, the, the, the other day uh, brought to my attention a poem by uh, Naomi Shahib Nye, which is called Kindness, a relatively well-known poem. Uh, but unknown to me, frankly, in which the whole basis of, of the poem is, it, the poem is called Kindness. And it's about kindness mm -hmm. and where kindness originates. And it had direct application to, to, this, to this book and to this character. Yes, this is a book about empathy. 
This is a what, book about people, about a person, about another, let's, yeah. I'm sorry. No. Let's let's talk, I don't care. <laughs> he learned empathy from his grandfather, didn't he? Yes, he did. In part. His grandfather was Honey Fitzgerald, one-time mayor of Boston and a congressman from Boston. Uh, I, I should add here, not parenthetically, that you don't learn empathy from Joseph and Rose Kennedy. <laughs> and I make that pretty clear in the book. Oh, yeah. These were not people who are empathetic figures. And I know that Rose Kennedy is often portrayed as the you know, opposite of Joe Kennedy, who was tough-minded and, and a, a, a hard-driving businessman and a man who was kind of self-possessed and, and self-centered, and that Rose was the opposite. She was kind and gentle. And indeed, in the mythology of the Kennedy family, within the Kennedy family, this was the portrayal. But mm -hmm. neither one of these people had an ounce of empathy. Joe Kennedy was driven and was cold and was self-interested. And Rose Kennedy was driven and was cold and was self-interested. They had different, their, their self-interest took different forms, but you don't learn empathy from those people. Mm -hmm. Ted learned empathy in, in a family sense from Honey Fitz, who would take him on these Sunday sojourns around Boston, where Honey Fitz would go into kitchens of hotels, would, would greet people on the street, ordinary people, and, and demonstrate, demonstrate by example to his grandson how you treat people, how people are meant to be treated. Not only the high-blown high, high, high folks, but the plebeians. Uh, now, that was one source, but there's another source. And again, I get back to this poem of kindness. Which, which begins, I, I, I have it here because it is so apt to understand why a man, why a man grew up in a family of tremendous wealth, but no empathy. Why this man became the voice of the voiceless, the power for the powerless. Uh, and, and it is this, before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. You must lose things that kindness is a function of suffering. And Ted Kennedy, even before his brothers died, Ted Kennedy understood suffering. He understood suffering, he understood humiliation. And the first part of the book is telling the story of how this boy, Ted Kennedy, was humiliated by his family, how he was the least of the Kennedys and always considered such how he was shuffled from one school to another at his mother's whim because she decided she wanted to go to Palm Beach. So she'd take him out of school and he'd be in Palm Beach for a few months. Then she decided she wanted to go back to Hyannis. So she'd move him out to Hyannis and, and how he was like in 11 schools in seven years. And at each school, he was tormented. Uh, how when he was just a, a, when he was seven years old, he was put into a school where the young, other youngest children were 11 years old but she didn't care. And that was Ted Kennedy's upbringing. And Ted Kennedy understood and identified with those who were marginalized because he was marginalized. In his own family, he was marginalized. Always the least, the youngest and the least. I, I almost felt as if he were an abused child as a kid from reading the book. I think that's a, a, an astute observation. And I think it's a true observation. Yeah. I think to some extent, all of the Kennedy children were abused and they dealt with it in different ways. John became diffident and detached. He was just a cool customer, you know, a guy who just kind of looked at the world sort of askance. Uh, mm -hmm. Bobby, you know, dealt with it by being tougher, rougher. Uh, the word that always attached to him, the Homeric epithet, so to speak, was ruthless. You know, Bobby Kennedy was ruthless. And it was only after John's death when he had suffered so greatly in, in, a, in a way that you know, just absolutely pulverized him um, that he learned to be tender. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ted, you know, came through it through these humiliations. But every Kennedy child, in one way or another, was abused. It was a, a, a dysfunctional family that 
I was designed to seem perfect. And it was the striving for the perfection that the Kennedys felt they had to achieve that was the most dysfunctional and, and dangerous part of that family. Uh, mm -hmm. The Kennedys were not perfection. They were anything but. The perfection hid, hid all of these really abuses, as, as you point out. Yeah. At what point does Ted transition from that garrulous, wisecracking kid to a thoughtful, solid young man? And what causes it, Neil? Well, you know, I'm not sure that the, the, the serious man wasn't always within that garrulous kind of hedonist that we often think of Ted Kennedy's being. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, and, and there are way stations. I don't, I don't, I'm not one who believes in sudden tra transformations. Bobby Kennedy's transformation was relatively sudden. Uh, because John Kennedy's death was just so traumatic. Bobby had attached himself to John. Uh, he lived through John. And so when John died, you know, he was so traumatized that it changed his life entirely. But for Ted Kennedy, there were a number of steps along the way. You know, things that, that uh, you know, he did uh, uh, that were, um, you know, kind of self-afflicted when he cheated in college and was thrown out of Harvard by having right. someone else take a Spanish exam for him, when he went into the army and as, as, a, as a kind of amends for being expelled from Harvard and, and met a group of people who were so different from him in almost every single way. Um, when, he, when his brother died, John, and then especially when uh, Robert died, and he felt, and, and, he, and, and he gave a speech to this effect, and he used these words, you know, that he had to pick up the fallen standard of his brothers. And mm -hmm. Robert's transformation in, you know, to, to, to pick up John's fallen standard, to become much more liberal than John had been, to become the moral voice of America, politically speaking, uh, when that voice was silenced with his assassination, you know, Ted Kennedy took up that, that standard and became that voice. And all of these events and others, you know, he suffered through a plane crash in 1964, uh, which, which he narrowly averted death, narrowly averted death, mm -hmm. and was in the hospital for over six months, flat on his back uh, with a broken back, um, not sure early on whether he would ever be able to walk again. All of these experiences, you know, informed Ted Kennedy. He was a man who understood suffering. And if kindness, you know, as the, as the poem says, is a function, is a function of suffering, Ted Kennedy suffered plenty. And that suffering was really the process of his maturation. I think in the book you say that he developed a presence. Am I right? Yes. Yes, he developed a, a, a presence. Um, you know, it, 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 he, he saw himself. He came to, to reimagine himself. And he reimagined himself as this moral person. Uh, and, and he dedicated his life, the rest of his life, to performing in that fashion. And the irony, of course, is that he did all sorts of immoral things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, you know, he, I, I always felt about Ted Kennedy there, of course, if you hate Ted Kennedy and most conservatives do, I mean, the idea is he was careless. He was hedonistic. He was Rabelaisian. Uh, he felt he could get away with anything. Um, and I think that's such a misreading of him, whether you like him or dislike him, it's a misreading of him. I, I feel uh, my interpretation is that Ted Kennedy was in a way, not only abused, but self-abused, and that mm -hmm. he sinned to be redeemed. So mm -hmm. when he committed these, these transgressions, he did so because he knew then that he would have to redeem himself. Yes. And that process of redemption was extremely important. For him. I was really fascinated in the early part of the story about his relationship with his brother, Bobby. It was special, wasn't it? It was special. And it was very different than his relationship with John or than Bobby's relationship with John. 
Mm -hmm. in, in, in one sense, uh, when early on, Bobby became a kind of surrogate father for him. John performed a bit of that same function, but the difference in ages was so great uh, that you know, he really didn't have much attachment to Ted, except in a vicarious way. It's odd that, that John and Ted you know, lived through each other vicariously in different ways, certainly a different way than, than Robert lived through John. Uh, Teddy admired John as a hero, and John admired Teddy as someone who could do all the things that John couldn't do because of John's own physical disabilities. And, right. and Teddy was strong, he was powerful, and he was hedonistic to a certain extent. And John, John's hedonism was quiet. Uh, Teddy's was never quiet, it was loud. Uh, but Teddy's relationship to, to Robert, um, very close, and again, uh, almost a, at, some, at some points, almost a, a father and son relationship, um, also was competitive. And when Bobby came into the Senate in 1964, a junior senator to Ted, because Ted had entered the Senate, uh, scarcely old enough to, to enter the Senate, he mm -hmm. just turned 30, uh, in 1962, he'd been there for two years, and the two brothers were in competition. Ted had always felt inferior. He'd been made to feel inferior, and he felt inferior. And, uh, mm -hmm. and Bobby made him feel inferior. So they had this strange relationship in which they, they worked very closely with one another. They clearly loved one another. Uh, but they also felt in competition with one another. A competition that, that Ted knew he couldn't really win because mm -hmm. Ted felt that Bobby was smarter than he was. Uh, Bobby was cannier than he was. Bobby could attract better staff than he could. And, and though he was always fighting to be Bobby's equal, uh, he himself thought it was a losing battle. And, and I'm point of fact, Bob, you know, in his memoir, True Compass, uh, there's not a lot of revelation in that memoir. Uh, Kennedy's are not really revelatory, self-revelatory. But there is mm -hmm. one line that is very self-revelatory. And that is this. He said, I, I always felt inferior to my brothers. I never thought I could ever be their equal. I yeah. think he felt that way to the end of his life. But he spent a good deal of his life trying to, if not win that competition, which he never thought he could do at least equalize that competition. And that was certainly part of his relationship to Bobby. And then when Bobby died, in a way, the equalization came because, as I said earlier, he became Bobby in a way. He did things for Bobby. He fulfilled Bobby's mission. Mm -hmm. So much of what he did after Bobby's death was a consequence of what he felt he owed Bobby to keep Bobby's legacy alive. You know, for me, one of the ironies of the story was that Jack became the president, Bobby became the vaunted attorney general, but Teddy, the youngest, the court jester, the affable brother, became the politician and the statesman. You're, you're right. You know, I, it's, it's funny. Um, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. had a line where he said, uh, John and, and Bobby had executive temperaments. You know, Ted had a parliamentary temperament. Ted was made for the Senate. Mm -hmm. He was not made necessarily for the presidency, although they were all groomed by their father for the presidency. But that was not really the way that Ted functioned. And in part, that was because of the way he functioned within the family. Being the youngest, he always had to be deferential. And that doesn't help when you're president of the United States. But right. it's almost essential if you want to make your way as a young man, particularly in the Senate. And Ted treated the Senate almost the way he treated his family. He was deferential to his elders. He was jovial. He was fun to be around, as he was in his own family. Um, you know, he would do the bidding of others in the Senate. And it were those, those they were called ninth, a ninth child's talent, his mother called it. He had a ninth child's talent for kind of, of cozying up to people and getting people to like him. John Kennedy did not have that talent. John mm -hmm. Kennedy, as I said, was cold. John Kennedy was aloof. Bobby certainly didn't have that talent. Bobby rubbed people the wrong way. 
usually in a good cause later in his life, but still rub people the wrong way. But right. Ted almost never rubbed people the wrong way. Mm. Ted rubbed people the right way. People like to be around Ted. Even Republicans in the Senate would say good things about Ted Kennedy. And Ted Kennedy used that ninth child's talent to become a master legislator in a way that John Kennedy was not. John Kennedy hated the Senate. It was clear that the Senate was a stepping stone. He barely showed up in the Senate most of the time. Ted, Bobby Kennedy, once during a, a hearing, uh, leaned over to, to Ted and said, you know, how can you stand this? How can you stand this? Because for, for Bobby, you know, he just wanted to get out of the Senate and get into the White House. Mm -hmm. But Ted Kennedy was a Senate man. And, and he understood how the Senate operated because he understood how the Kennedy family operated, which was pretty much like the Senate. <laughs> right. I found it remarkable how senators and congressmen of both parties used to socialize regularly and they would leave their partisanship at the door. You have that wonderful scene in the prologue of your book about how Ted and John McCain went at each other over an issue like snapping dogs and then broke out laughing. Um, Kenny Duberstein, who was Ronald Reagan's last chief of staff, and uh, by the way, my camp counselor, uh, <laughs> told me how he mourned those wonderful nights when they would play cards for uh, members of both parties and uh, just had drink together, but that now Democrats and Republicans wouldn't be seen with each other for fear of losing their job. Remarkable, isn't it? It really is. Well, of course, you write about that in, in, in your wonderful Reagan biography, you write about you know how that the, the transition of that uh, of, of that comedy in in the uh, in the Senate, and I write about it in this book. And in fact, it becomes a subplot of the book. Uh, it's almost impossible to imagine, unless you're an old goat like I am, that uh, you know Republicans and Democrats actually got along once upon a time, and the mm. Republicans and Democrats, though they had different approaches to solving problems, nevertheless generally wanted to solve problems. And that Republicans, although never, in my estimation, having the same form of empathy that the Democrats had in, in the Senate, nevertheless uh, could on occasion uh, demonstrate tremendous empathy. And I think a, an example of that, and I write about it in the book, is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which could never pass the Senate today. You know, as much as I hate to say it, I think all of, all of our listeners can realize that the, the, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, probably the key piece of legislation of the 20th century, could not pass a Republican Senate. But in those days, one of the most moving speeches during the debate, at the end of that debate, was delivered by the Senate Minority Leader, Everett Dirksen, no liberal, a conservative, Everett Dirksen of, of Illinois, who said some issues have, their, their time has come. And this is an issue whose time has come. That was the Republican minority leader who attracted 22 Republicans to vote for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was a different institution, a completely different institution, in which you know Democrats and, and Republicans co-mingled, uh, in which they were there were social friendship, um, in which they didn't go after one another. Uh, it was a very, very different place. And Ted Kennedy was very much a part of that kind of institution and tried to extend that sense of amity uh, even into the Reagan years, long after it had begun to disappear. Uh, it is a remarkable thing that that's the way that American politics once functioned and almost certainly will never function again. And Ted Kennedy, as I said, was, was thrived on that sense of, of you know, mutuality. There was only one person. Ted was not a hater, never a hater. Bobby was a hater. Ted was not a hater. There was only one person he ever said in, in his Senate tenure he ever hated, and that was Jesse Helms. And he hated Jesse Helms primarily because Jesse Helms, who tried to stymie Ted at every point on civil rights legislation and other things, was particularly heinous 
heinous when it came to legislation that Ted pushed, the Ryan White Act on AIDS. Mm -hmm. And Helm's hatred of gay men and women was something that Ted Kennedy could not abide. Yeah. And that was the only hatred he had. He didn't hate other Republicans. He was friendly with them. Friendly with almost all of them. I wonder, Bob, if you'd speak to, to having written about Reagan, you, you speak to that transition because it's so critical to in our understanding of you know, the, the Congress today. Well, the first thing that Reagan did was to uh, have Ken Duberstein, who was his man on the Hill, go to each one of the Senate senators and congressmen's office and introduce himself, Democrat or Republican, and tell them that the president's door was always open. And if they ever needed to speak to Reagan or to see Reagan, just to let Ken know, and they would gain entry. And Reagan kept that promise throughout, well, at least the first term. Uh, so there, there was, uh, you know, an open door policy. I, I really wondered if you looked at this work through the prism of current politics, or, or did you choose to ignore that, Neil? You know, I started this book long before we had our, our current situation. Mm. Uh, you know, I started this book, as I say, 10 years ago. Uh, but even then, I thought that political morality was a, was a critical issue. We talk about politics all the time, and we're hesitant, both those of us who write about politics and, and you know, in the press itself, people don't want to raise morality um, because they confuse it with moralism. And morality's gotten a bad name. Frankly, Republicans have given it a bad name. I'll be honest about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I didn't, I obviously, I didn't write this book with um, the current situation in mind uh, because the current situation is a harvest of what was sown many, many years ago. You know, just recently, Stuart Stevens, the Republican operative, has written a book about this very thing and wrote an op-ed in the New York Times just, I think, three days ago in which he came clean, and he pretty much put it that way, that the Republican Party had feasted on racism, on cruelty, feasted on. Uh, and that what we're seeing now is not the, some sudden break with Republicanism, but the fulfillment of Republicanism. So in writing the book, I mean, that had always been, you know, on my mind. Uh, I tried not to let, you know, current politics impact the book because I didn't want to write. I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, though it's, it's foolish to think this way and it's certainly delusions of, of grandeur, you know, that you write a book to be read 50 or 100 years from now, not only to be read, you know, uh, five days from now. And, um, and this book, you know, is, is really written about political morality and its changes over time so that I hope it informs where we are now. I certainly hope it does that. I hope by reading this book, you will understand, as, as I came to understand, which is why I wrote the book, how we got here, how we got to this, this situation. But, you know, it, it wasn't on a daily basis as I was writing the book. I always, I, I tell my students this, um, one of the ways you write a, a, a book like this, there are two things you have to do. One, you have to deal with it as, as if it were method acting. I think biographers, and Bob, you can also speak to this. You, you, and I once wrote an essay about this for the Washington uh, Post book world, that biographers are method actors. Um, you try and find the correspondences in your own life with the subject about whom you're writing and feel those things. Feel them in your bones, in every cell of your body. I wanted to feel Ted Kennedy every single day, the way I felt Walt Disney or Walter Winchell. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you do that. And the other thing is, um, I always tell my students, stay in the moment. 
you obviously know how the story turns out. I know what happens to Ted Kennedy. I mean, everybody does. But you write as if you don't know how it's going to turn out. And you write with that sense of immediacy. I think it gives the book drama. Uh, but it also gives the book, as I say, immediacy. I think that's one of the most interesting things, the narrative of your story. It was a complete page turner. I couldn't put it down. As you say, I know full well how this story turns out. I also knew what happens almost along every step of the way. Of course. It's, the way it's the way you present it, the way you keep your reader engaged and right in front of you. That is, it's the biographer's work in addition to uh, perfect research. I think uh, you really have to keep your eye on the story, keep your eye on the narrative and make it a, a, a great page turner. Well, that's one of the things you're so great at. And uh, again, I don't want to make this a, you know, a mutual admiration society, but you are one of the great storytellers, you know, among biographers. I mean, you really, really do that extremely well. And I, and I always, you know, I always feel I can, I can tell anyone how to write biography in six words. Uh, here's everything you need to know. What's the story and what's the point? And the real art of biography is not just telling a story. There are some very famous biographers who are good storytellers. Um, but I sometimes feel when I read them, I'm not going to mention any names, obviously. Uh, <laughs> you'll know some of these people. But, uh, you know, as I read them, I say, well, you know, you're telling a good story, but you could just as well have written a, a novel you know, if you're going to do that. Um, but I always look to, you know, what's the point? Why am I writing this? Every piece of writing has to be about something. And in this case, I mean, not about Walt Disney or about, you know, Walter Winchell or about the Hollywood moguls in my first book or about Ted Kennedy. But as I said, this book is about political morality. And the real art of this, I'm not saying I have this, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I've got, I've got this art, but of the people I most admire, and Bob is among them, but the people I most admire who do this, and I read a lot of biography, are the people who are able to merge those two things, the story and the point, and to do it seamlessly so that you don't feel you're reading something that's didactic, but you also don't feel that you're just getting a beach read. And that, again, that's, that's the art of it. If you can do that, you're really good. If you can do that, you've mastered it. I always feel that we have to put something of ourself into the story. And at, at a certain point, we almost merge with the person that we're writing about. Did your opinion of Ted Kennedy change while you were writing this book? My opinion of Ted or my opinion of myself? <laughs> no, your opinion of Ted, your opinion of Ted. Uh, yeah, no, oh, my opinion, I, I, I never begin. Well, I, I can't say never because that's foolish. I try to begin with as few preconceptions as possible. When I, when I begin a story like this, you know, I, I'm always saying I'm going to follow the trail wherever it leads. And Bob, you and I have had these discussions previously. People are complicated. I remember one particular discussion you and I had because people will ask, for example, did you like so-and-so? And, you know, I don't want to, you know, uh, hurt anybody's feelings when they ask that question. You know, I like to be empathetic myself, but I don't think that's the right question. It's not people about whom you write biography, particularly. All people are complicated. Everyone is complicated. And there are good things and bad things about all of us. And when you're writing biography, you know just about all the good things and you know just about all the bad things because you've devoted years and years and years to unearthing those things. So, you know, do I like him? Do I not like him? Well, you know, I like his life. His life is a gift to me. All the people about whom I write, their lives are gifts to me that I try and use to explore the things I want to explore. But did my opinion of Ted Kennedy change in the course of the book is your question. And I would say, yes, it did. Yes, it did. Again, I tried to begin this with few preconceptions. I wasn't in love with Ted Kennedy. I'm never in love with any of my subjects, nor do I hate any of them when I begin. And I generally don't end a book either being in love with them or detesting them. It's just not how my mind works when I'm writing this. But I came to have 
enormous, enormous admiration for him. With the kind of equanimity with which he went through a very difficult life. And I, I'll tell you one story, Bob, because to me, it's the kind of quintessential Ted Kennedy story. And it's not in this volume, it's in volume two. Uh, so I'm gonna, this is a spoiler alert, because uh, I know you're all gonna rush out and buy volume two. But anyway, it's a story that to me is, qu is the quintessential story. In 1991, a journalist by the name of Michael Kelly wrote a piece for GQ called Teddy on the Rocks. And as you can tell from the title, it wasn't a positive story. Basically the story was, and you can make a career on this, by the way, in those days you could. Basically the story was that Ted Kennedy was a souse, a womanizer, a louse, uh, a moral bankrupt. Uh, you know, you name it, Ted Kennedy was it. Ted Kennedy was on the rocks. His life was tumbling out of control. He was just, you know, he, he was, his nose was red from too much drinking. Uh, he was an alcoholic. Uh, as I say, he was a sybarite. He was all, all of those things. And I won't go into the sourcing of that piece or whatever. Uh, when, I, when I had a, a Shorenstein Fellowship at Harvard University, I wrote my paper on the press and Ted Kennedy. And I took four episodes in Kennedy's life. And that episode of Palm Beach in 1991 was one of the episodes about which I wrote. And I went through that piece and I, I sourced that piece. It was horribly sourced, horribly sourced. It should have never been published in a magazine. And I'm not saying that because I'm defending Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy had his problems and alcohol was one of them. But he wrote this piece, Michael Kelly, and it destroyed Ted Kennedy. And I would say that no piece damaged Ted Kennedy's reputation as much as that piece did. If you go through LexisNexis, which I did, you'll see how many times that piece is cited. Everywhere that piece is cited as evidence, evidence that Ted Kennedy is a moral bankrupt. Okay, Ted was deeply hurt by this piece. Deeply hurt. Not only, I said he was damaged. He was damaged politically and in other ways. He was personally hurt. Because he was not a man who hurt other people. Say what you want about Ted Kennedy. He was not a man who hurt other people. So Michael Kelly writes this piece. Writes it to boost his reputation. It does. It does exactly that in conservative circles. He becomes a, a big guy. Not only in conservative circles. He ultimately was the, became the editor of the New Republic. And for a while, the editor of Atlantic. Uh, and when the first Gulf War came, Michael Kelly, who was a conservative, despite the fact that he worked for the you know, New Republic or whatever, was a very, he was a cheerleader for that war. And he went to, uh, to uh, Iraq. And uh, actually, it's the second, excuse me, it's the second Gulf War, second Gulf War, not the first, second Gulf War. The even least, the, the less defensible one. And he goes to Iraq, cheerleading for the war. And he's in a, a Humvee and they, it comes under attack. And the driver is trying to, you know, uh, avoid zigzagging, trying to avoid the fire. And the vehicle hits a ditch and rolls over. And the driver and Michael Kelly are killed. That night, Michael Kelly, whom Ted Kennedy had every reason in the world to hate, to hate. That night, Michael Kelly, who at the time was working for the Atlantic, who lived in Boston because at that time, the Atlantic was out of Boston. His widow gets a phone call. It's Ted Kennedy. Ted says, is there anything I can do for you? And she says, yes, there is. In fact, there is. I think I'm going to have difficulty getting his body out of Iraq. 
And Ted Kennedy said, consider it done. I'll get it back tomorrow. A remarkable story. A remarkable story, Neil. That says everything you need to know about Ted Kennedy. Everything you need to know, to me, is in that story. And, and you can disparage him all you want. You can say anything you want about him. Yeah. How many people would do that? Right. I would. Um, I, I think we're going to take a question or two from, uh, from the people at home. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to the host of, uh, of the show and uh, see if you can get a question from some people who are avid Neil Gabler fans. Oh, I, I don't know about that, but I'll take a question from anyone. <laughs> um, so why don't you raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask. Uh, we'll start with Steve Rosen. You have to unmute yourself. Well, um, I'm thinking about November and I'm thinking about the appearance of this book in, in November and the issues of, of political morality. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you might imagine uh, the presidential candidates reading this book and what they might say about it. You know, it's, it's funny you raise that, Steve, because I was adamant that the book come out before the election and, it, and we made it just barely. It was not the easiest thing in the world because I can't cut corners when, when you spend this much time on a book, um, you don't rush it into production. Uh, but I wanted it out before the election because I hoped in some very, very small way, and I'm a speck in the universe, um, that at least it would give us an opportunity to discuss political morality in the context of this, this election. Uh, so, you know, what impact might it have? Well, um, I'm not giving anything away when I tell you that we have one candidate who is empathetic and a man who is, if kindness comes from suffering, this man has suffered so mightily that it's no wonder uh, he exudes kindness. And then on the other hand, we have a man who has never suffered, who is cruel and ignorant and corrupt and narcissistic. And it's important, you know, it, it's very interesting when we, again, when we look at politics, we look at the record, the political wreckage, and we say that all of our institutions have been destroyed. All the guardrails that are supposed to protect America are gone. We have, you know, a monster who cares nothing for any other human being and nothing for any of the institutions of government. But that wreckage is minor. Gigantic, yes, he's raised R-A-Z-E-D, the entire American enterprise. But that wreckage is minor. Because the major wreckage is the moral revolution that this country is undergoing. And when you look at what's happened over the last four years, this country has lost its moral compass. And I don't know if we can ever get it back again. And I want to discuss that. And yes, I'm passionate about it. And, you know, people may not like the fact that I, I want to address this. But I do want to address it through the life of Ted Kennedy. Because Ted Kennedy, R Richard Reeves, the, the late and wonderful political writer, used this term after Ted's death. He called him a politically, a, a publicly, excuse me, a publicly moral man. Now, whatever his private morality, he was always a publicly moral man. And it's incumbent upon us to think morally, not just political. We need moral regeneration. Moral regeneration, not moralistic regeneration. We've had plenty of that. In fact, the genius of conservatism was to delegitimize the moral values of liberalism. That was its genius. To delegitimize them and to replace them with moralism. So-called traditional American values. I'll give you a traditional value, empathy. Caring about other people. 
taking the marginalized and bringing them to the center. How's that for a traditional value? Treating other people with respect. How's that for a traditional value? So, yes, I'm angry when it comes to that. And perhaps it animates the book at points. But I want that discussion. I want to be part of that discussion. And I hope the book, in its very, very small way, can help animate that discussion. In Neil, it's Bob again. In light of what you've just said, how do you think Ted would have navigated the current Senate waters? Well, you know, I think he would have navigated it. I, I think we understand um, that Ted would have addressed all of these things the, the way that we all do. I mean, he would have, you know, decried the, the, the ignorance, the incompetence, the corruption, the cravenness, the narcissism, the cruelty, the ugliness. But the difference, I think, Bob, the difference is that is, is what I've just you know, laid out. It's the context of it. You know, we can talk about the personal failings of, of this man in the White House. And we can talk about the failings of his party and all of those things. But Ted Kennedy would have done something that we hear too little of even from the Pelosi's and the Schumer's and the whatever. And that is, let's frame a moral discussion about this. Not just talking about the politics, a moral discussion. A moral discussion about putting children in cages. A moral discussion about believing that an extra $600 a week makes people unwilling to work. A moral discussion about how African Americans are treated. Ted Kennedy would have framed this as a moral discussion because though he was a mighty pragmatist when it came to legislation, he was a moral exemplar when it came to promoting the context for that legislation. And I think he would have, that's the discussion we're not having enough of. And Ted would have framed that discussion. Of course, he would have been appalled, and I think he would have been depressed. And Ted, though he was often an optimist, was also a fatalist. And I think he would have realized this, that the America in which he believed, that America's gone. That America isn't coming back. We're one election away from losing everything. Ted would have known that, because he was no Pollyanna. No Pollyanna at all. He was a dark soul under that careless, you know, outward bonhomie. He was a dark soul. And I try and tell that story in the book, too. Who's next? All right. <laughs> Judy. Green. I silenced you all. Huh? <laughs> all on, all on song. Hey, Mr. Gabler. It's Dan Mallory. Oh, Dan, how are you? I'm fine. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Dan's parents are my neighbors. <laughs> yes. And of course, Dan's a very noted author in his own right. But. I've only written one book. You've written how many? Uh, there's still seven now. Okay, so uh, yes, yes. Yes, but yours was much more successful than any of mine. <laughs> okay, we can, <laughs> I'll take it. I wanted to, to ask you, I, I'm speaking actually not as a fellow writer, but as a former publisher, it's been quite interesting to note that the book industry in both the US and the UK is astoundingly buoyant compared to this time last year. And that's largely due to this influx of political books, mm -hmm. memoirs, biographies, mm -hmm. hit pieces, what have you. How do you feel about this dramatic influx into the American reading market of so many books that concern themselves ostensibly, nominally, with po political ideologies and politics itself. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Are some of them hurting the cause? Whatever that's that might question. be. Good question. And, you know, I, I mean, I, you, the, the, the road answer would be, it's tremendous, the more the merrier and all of that stuff. You know, but, but there's a Gresham's Law in publishing as there is in, uh, in money, you know, that uh, the bad drives out the good. And, uh, 
you know, books that are um, poorly argued, poorly written, uh, books that appeal only to one, you know, kind of, of um, ideology. Um, I don't think those books serve any particular cause. Um, so I think the, the, the answer is, you know, it depends on the book. Um, you know, it, it, to find a challenging book, and they're certainly out there, uh, there are many of them, uh, to find a challenging book, a book that, that, you know, challenges even your own preconceptions is a good thing. And I think it's good that people are thinking about politics and thinking about them in serious ways. Um, and books that enable us to think about politics in serious ways, you know, that's a wonderful thing because frankly, uh, we haven't been thinking about politics in particularly serious ways for quite a long time. And uh, the way our media have covered politics, uh, you know, is, is an instance of that. Um, it's pretty disgraceful. It's taken a long time for the media to, to, to finally show some guts and some muscle. And I still don't think they're showing enough of it. But uh, you know, again, if you're looking for a book that informs you rather than plays to your prejudices, you know, more power to you and more power to the publishing industry for, for publishing those kinds of books. Of course, the most popular books are the ones that do precisely that, that, pay, that play to a prejudice. I mean, when you look at the bestsellers list, it's, you know, you, you want to you write a book about, you know, um, how Obama, you know, destroyed the world and was some sort of communist agent, that'll be, you know, that'll be in the top five on the bestsellers list. So, you know, um, does that serve any useful purpose? Not in my estimation, nor frankly, do the books that attack Trump, uh, uh, you know, endlessly serve any particular useful purpose, except in so far as they reveal him. But, you know, would I ever write a, a, a book that simply sits down and, and attacks some, a, some person who I fi feel is reprehensible? I would never write that kind of book. It wouldn't particularly interest me in writing sure. that, nor would it interest me in reading it. I haven't read any of these anti, you know, Trump books. They just don't interest me. Well, they, they seem to expire, but they're not exactly imperishable, are they? They're no, and two weeks of publicity and then we've moved on. You're exactly right. And, you know, though it's, it's uh, uh, foolish and immodest for me to say so, as I said earlier, you know, I try and write books that are imperishable. Yeah. No, all books perish. <laughs> as our president said of COVID, it, it all goes away. And that's certainly true of every book that's ever been written, except for Shakespeare and a few others. <laughs> Um, okay, we are at the end of our hour. Would, would Neil or Bob like to say something to wrap up? Neil, um, once again, what a wonderful book. Uh, I, I enjoyed it from the, the very first page until the very last page. It had your stamp all over the book, which is what I was well, looking for. And thank what you. I Let me just thank you. I want, I want to thank Bob, who's, who's just a wonderful biographer, a wonderful friend, and someone who commiserates, we commiserate with one another when, on, on biography all the time. So I want to thank you, Bob. And I also want to thank, I know that I have a lot of friends, you know, in, in the audience um, tonight. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Where is he? Uh, there you are. Oh, I, I thank you for unmuting me. I'm going to be very brief. I just want to thank all my friends uh, for supporting me, being there with me, and uh, I love you all. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Bob and Neil, and we'll see you next summer under the tent. <laughs> all right, looking forward to it. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Be well. Have a great night. All right.